everyone, and welcome to this first night of a two-night Egypt series here on Monday Night Travel. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be with you tonight as a moderator. And now I would like to welcome our tour guide, Rick Steves, who will be taking us to Egypt. Hi, Rick. Hey, Ben. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for putting this all together, and thanks to everybody for joining us. It's so exciting to be able to just um, share our love of travel and get together every week. And that's what Monday night travel is all about. This is, uh, you know, during this lockdown for me, if I'm not in Europe, I'm usually jetting around the country, visiting with different groups and giving talks. I just love to do that. So each Monday we have this chance to get together and I'm sure enjoying it and appreciating you joining us as well. So now it's time to get make sure you're cozy, be with some of your favorite travel partners, I hope, and your loved ones. And uh, I got my, uh, you're kind of my guest tonight in my house, and uh, I'm just thankful that you're going to travel with me. Uh, it's becoming kind of a tradition that we eat the appropriate food for the culture. So I was wondering, what am I going to eat for Egypt? And then I thought, I've got a friend who runs an Eastern Mediterranean restaurant. His name is Shazad. It's right here in my hometown. It's called Caravan Kebab. And Shazad just brought me over a nice spread. And I want to introduce you to my spread before we get over to Egypt, because uh, you got to have a good, um, a good meal, I think, before you travel. Um, when you think about Egyptian food, remember, you got that lush river going, cutting through the desert, north and south, the Nile River, and all of this food would be growing along the, the fertile banks of the Nile. Uh, it's a vegetarian friendly cuisine, that's for sure. There's lots of lamb and you're into pigeon kebabs and so on, but, but you could be a very happy vegetarian in Egypt. If you're a little confused about Eastern Mediterranean food, is this Egyptian or Greek or Israeli or Palestinian or, or Lebanese? Well, the answer is yes, because it seems like they all claim this stuff and it, it works just everywhere. I mean, for instance, I've got my stuffed grape leaves and I've got my tzatziki sauce. And the stuffed grape leaves are usually filled with rice and herbs and spices, sometimes some ground meat. Uh, the tzatziki is yogurt with cucumbers, garlic, mint, and fresh dill. And uh, you can just dip your stuffed um, uh, grape leaves into the tzatziki. But that's something you would find in Greece for sure. Um, you got your pita bread. And this is that pocket bread. We're going to go into a bakery in a few minutes and see it being made. And uh, I was just uh, reading up on this. And the word in Egyptian for bread is, is related to the word for to be alive. This is the bread of life. Give us this day our daily bread. The Egyptians have bread subsidized by the government. You see people biking around town with wooden racks on their head filled with loaves of balloon kind of bread. And that's really the, the basic food for a, a, a very... Uh, a uh, poor person in Egypt, they would live pretty much on that pita bread and uh, bean dip. That would be the, the very basic uh, way that you'd get your sustenance. Uh, and you dip it into wonderful spreads. The, probably the most famous one is baba, baba ganoush. There you see a nice baba ganoush. And baba ganoush is just fun to say, but this is, uh, it's a dip of egg, roasted and smoked eggplant, which is really good. Lemon juice, parsley, cumin oil, and tahini. And tahini is a sesame paste with garlic. But you dip your, your uh, pita bread in there, and it is just delightful. I've been nibbling on this because this is our second show. I was just uh, um, introducing this and eating this uh, an hour ago with another group. And here we have our hummus. And uh, you probably know hummus. It's mashed chickpeas. And you can see some unmashed chickpeas on the top. And this hummus also has, um, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's got a sauce of smoked paprika, which is just delightful. Um, it's uh, Egypt, it, oh, we're gonna have dessert later on. And of course, when you're in the Eastern Mediterranean, there's lots of nice, sweet, honey kind of desserts. This is the baklava with all the, the phyllo and uh, walnuts. And that's something that is a delight. Um, you know, in, in a Muslim country, observant Muslims avoid alcohol. If you're gonna have a beer, you can do it in your hotel or you can do it in fancy restaurants that cater to tourists, but it's, it's good style to embrace the local culture when you're out and about. And in Egypt, the national drink for practicing Muslims would be hmm, tea. Okay, so we'll be, uh, I'll be munching through the, uh, through the event here and I hope you've got something good to munch also. We produced a TV show on Egypt 20 years ago, 1999, we made a show. And uh, it's one of the very first shots I did, shows I did with Simon, my producer I've been with ever since. And Simon and I have long wanted to go back and do a better job and update it and so on. So this last year, we, we shot a year ago right now. We shot a year ago, it was um, uh, late November, early December, 2019. I was there in 2015 scouting 
and I was all ready to go the next year, but things got crazy with their revolution and their political disruptions and so on. I thought it's not a good time to be uh, enthusing about Egypt. So I back burner did, and then I decided last year, it's time to go to Egypt. So we got it together and we went in 2019, we produced a one hour special. And uh, that's aired all over the country. And out of that one hour special, we took two episodes. So today we're seeing the Cairo section of the one hour special. And next Monday at Monday Night Travel, we're gonna do the Nile, which is no Cairo at all, but it'll be Alexandria, Luxor, ancient Thebes, King Tut's tomb and so on, cruising the Nile down to Aswan and then to the wonderful ruins at up the temple at Abu Simbel. On this shoot, we had two cameramen. We normally don't have two, two shooters, but on this shoot, we decided we wanted that. And thank goodness, we had our local fixer, Tarek. Tarek's a friend of mine. He runs a wonderful tour company. It's called Egypt and Beyond. And a lot of my friends have uh, booked uh, tours with Tarek and his guides. And Tarek made sure that we had everything lined up and ready to go. But even with the very best fixer around, it's complicated in Egypt. And if you're doing a TV shoot, you better bring a lot of money for backsheesh, you know, and there's better be ready for a lot of bureaucratic snafus and overlapping and confused security concerns. And there is a lot of inefficiency to try to run a business or do something in Egypt. And you'll learn that when you go there with some work to do like we did with our TV show. But we got it done. It took us about 16, 14 or 16 days to do two shows. And you're going to see right now the work of uh, one busy week of shooting. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, right now, I'm just thrilled to introduce you to Egypt. So let's see here. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, venturing beyond Europe to a land where there's no shortage of serendipity. We're in Egypt. It's Cairo. Thanks for joining us. Cairo, straddling the Nile, is the biggest city in North Africa and the biggest in the Middle East. It's the capital of Egypt and one of the leading cities in Islam. With about 20 million people in Greater Cairo, it's bursting at the seams and pulsing with energy. Look at that spot to start a show on Cairo. That's the rooftop of our hotel. And uh, it was just uh, tricky to find a quiet spot with a wide shot where we weren't going to get the police asking us, what are you doing with that big camera? So we had a chance here to uh, enjoy shooting from the rooftop of our hotel. Um, you know, every show has the same structure in the beginning. We start with a tease. That was me in the little three-wheeled taxi. And then we have our fancy produced, carefully produced show open. Then we have the on camera right now that says what we're going to do. Coming up next is the montage and then the map. The montage is the last thing we shoot and the montage is, uh, or it's the last thing we put together and write in the script because we don't know what's going to be in the montage till we've done the show. And then I, I really enjoy it with Simon because we go through the whole show and we decide, well, we'll really pick people's curiosity. What can we show in this little appetizer of the show? So that comes up next in the montage and then the map. And I'm committed to that map because I'm committed to inspiring people to visit these places. And with a map, you understand what is the spread of the show. And in that map, we try to give as much practical information as we possibly can. And this energy will carry us to some of Cairo's greatest sites and most vibrant neighborhoods. We'll explore the back streets local style, help chisel a tombstone, greet the ancient Sphinx, marvel at King Tut's gold, drop in on a mosque, buy one, two, free today, cheap it cheap, haggle with a gauntlet of eager merchants, have dinner at home with a family, and marvel at the pyramids. In the southeast of the Mediterranean, Egypt, 50% bigger than Texas, gathers its 100 million people mostly along the Nile River. We'll explore its leading city, Cairo, and finish at the Pyramids of Giza. Cairo is a fascinating clash between traditional and modern, religious and secular, east and west. While its chaos can be exasperating, it can also be a rewarding challenge for the adventurous traveler. Cairo's downtown is modern and can feel European. 
Streets, squares, and grand buildings are reminders of the country's colonial past from the 19th and early 20th centuries. The riverfront throbs with energy, stately bridges busy with traffic, fancy riverside restaurants, and towering apartment complexes. The Nile is still the lifeblood of the city, sprawling endlessly on both sides. The heart of Cairo is Tahrir Square. It's long been ground zero for the people's spirit. If there's a demonstration going on, and there have been massive ones in recent years, it's likely here. So that was pretty exciting to be on Tahrir Square. And most of us saw the news reports of those horrific demonstrations. And this was the epicenter of those demonstrations. Now, they've worked very hard to make it just feel very normal. All the fancy European international class hotels are circling this square. In the far back, that salmon colored building is the National Museum with all the great art. And it felt quite comfortable. Uh, I had to kind of walk a tightrope here about how how uh, political I wanted to get with my writing because Egypt's having some interesting challenges going on and I really decided to steer away from that in this show. I also had to decide how much do I want to encourage other people to go there because it's not the easiest country to travel in. It's certainly welcoming and I certainly love traveling there, but I'm not sure it's right for everyone. So I had to kind of decide how do I want to calibrate that. Also right now we're going to talk about it's a religious center. It's the it's one of the leading cities in all of Islam of a billion Muslims. It's the city of a thousand minarets and we needed to get good shots that showed that off. We're going to see me on, on camera in a moment with the minarets behind me. And I remember I was actually standing on a bench to be able to get the right frame so we could see me next to those beautiful minarets. In addition to its political energy, the city's long been a religious capital. Ever since, the forces of Islam swept across North Africa from Arabia in the seventh century, spreading the teachings of their prophet Muhammad. Cairo has been a leading city of the Muslim world. And today, Cairo's known as the city of a thousand minarets. Stepping into Al Hussein Mosque, like any neighborhood mosque, you'll find a worshipful tranquility. So for me, producing these TV shows, I really like to get into places of worship. Um, as a visitor who's genuinely in a worshipful frame of mind and genuinely curious about the culture. Sometimes it's tough to get permission to film in there because they don't want a camera in your face when you're worshiping and so on. And uh, I would come in here and scout with Simon, my producer, and we'd whisper and clasp our hands and, and be quite worshipful and, and polite and quiet. And then we'd suss it out and decide what we want to shoot. And then I would go back out and we didn't want to have a big Group, so I would just come in next with the cameraman. And instead of the big TV camera, he would have his little SLR type camera, which gets beautiful footage as you'll see here. And then we just kind of stand quietly and shoot what we can as respective, respectively as possible. I wanted to show women worshiping and men worshiping and a little bit of cat and mouth with, mouse with the security guards uh, because there are some legitimate security issues in these mosques. But this to me was just great to show a working mosque with people worshiping that wasn't a touristy mosque. Most of us go to the famous touristy mosques and they kind of steer the tourists that way. But a tourist can step into a mosque if they are respectful um, and be quite welcome to enjoy looking around and checking out the scene. It's believed that resting here invigorates the soul. There's more intensity around the adjacent shrine believed to contain a sacred relic the head of Al Hussein ibn Ali, a grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. In a mosque, men and women worship separately. As praying can be physical, with lots of bending over, it's considered more respectful to allow women their own space. I find that a respectful tourist is welcome to be a part of the scene. Along with minarets, you'll see church spires, especially in Cairo's Coptic Quarter. While Egypt is predominantly Muslim, today about 10% of the country is Christian. The Egyptian or Coptic Church actually predates Islam by six centuries. Because they worship in an Orthodox style, stepping into a Coptic Mass is like going back in time. The faithful believe that when Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus escaped Herod by fleeing to Egypt, this very spot is where they took refuge. 
Later, in 43 AD, it's believed the evangelist Mark came to Egypt and established the Coptic Church. Mark was their first pope, and the first in an unbroken line of Coptic popes stretching back nearly 2,000 years. So this was, by the way, a great opportunity to see a Coptic church actually worshiping. We went there on our first visit and there was nothing going on. It's kind of hard to predict when there's going to be incense and people worshiping and, and, and priests out and about. Uh, we went back uh, after I was already, I, I always give the crew one day after we're done to just go around the town and get little extra credit shots. And uh, I go off to my next uh, gig or whatever in, in Europe and the crew stays there and has that luxury day to get, get those extra needed bits to make the show really sparkle. And they went back that morning and got what you just saw there, that beautiful, beautiful Coptic church in full glory, in, in worship mode. Coming up now, we're looking at security. And it's always tough to film security. So this was tricky, but I just wanted to show the real thing so travelers who are dreaming about going to Egypt won't be blindsided. But there's security everywhere. And there's a sort of attention, especially here in the Coptic neighborhoods, and understandably so. This is the only time in my career as a TV host on travel shows that I've ever said, you need to stay in a fancy, big, expensive hotel just to be comfortable. But that I feel very strongly about when you go to Cairo. It's worth having an international class hotel with international class security so you can have that refuge and then venture out. I was really careful not to enthuse about Egypt to the point where I would inspire some of my public television viewers who would be less comfortable on the road. I didn't want to get anybody into trouble. I love it. My friends who've been there love it. But whether or not it's appropriate for you to visit without a tour, it's up to you. I found very few tourists in Egypt that were not on a tour or with a guide. It can be done, but it's not as open as Turkey, for example. The Coptic Quarter comes with high security. Throughout Egypt, travelers will notice armed guards, security barriers, and a high-profile police presence. These are reminders of a pent-up tension in Egyptian society. They reveal the challenges Egyptian democracy faces today. While many modern Muslims would prefer a separation of mosque and state, others believe Egypt should be ruled in accordance with a strict interpretation of the Quran. Religious fundamentalism is a challenge here, as it is in America. Cairo is intense. I love traveling here, but I do it with safety and sanity in mind. While prices on the street may be cheap, if you want rich world comfort, you'll pay rich world prices. I sleep in an international class hotel. It comes with first class security. I hope the future will be more relaxed, but for now, I splurge for the peace of mind. Cairo's mighty citadel, capped by a dramatic 19th century mosque, is a reminder that the need for security is nothing new here. For nearly 700 years, this was the fortified home of Egypt's rulers and government. Back in the 13th century, it was one of the most impressive such fortifications of the age. So I just want to remind you, you can see this show without any pauses anytime you want. You can go to ricksteves.com uh, and go to the TV section and watch the Egypt show. You can watch the one hour version or you can watch the half hour episodes, one on Cairo or one on the Nile. We're seeing Cairo today and Nile a week from today. Uh, I also want to remind you that we, um, we record this event and we post it on Facebook, Rick Steves on Facebook tomorrow. We always post Monday Night Travel on Tuesday on Facebook. Also, we're coming into right now what we call a face montage. And the, the essence of good travel is people. And one of my very favorite things to do in these TV shows is to help produce what we call this face montage. And whenever I propose that, my producer Simon says, okay, but you gotta give us time in our schedule to get some good faces. It takes time. And uh, we dedicated the time. And then our producer, Steve Camarano, beautifully edited it together. But here, just right now, this little, Wonderland, beautiful local faces, gives you a sense of the, the magic of traveling in Egypt. Buildings only partially represent the story here. The people you see on the streets are the living descendants of one of the oldest and greatest civilizations in history. The people of today's Egypt represent the latest chapter in a story that goes back 5,000 years. Even if you don't understand its long and complicated history, 
just observing how old and new come together is rewarding to the traveler. Egypt's heritage goes back twice as far as ancient Rome. And ancient Egypt, that's what draws the tourists. The so here we are at the iconic, most important spot in all of Egypt, if you're just trying to get one image that you can show off about this amazing country. And I was giving this on camera here, and uh, I, uh, I pulled it off, but I was really nervous. Uh, in my periphery, I could see two camels coming at us, and they were two policemen on camels, and they were coming uh, to ask us for money. You know, it's this bakshis business, so we had to have we had a whole brick of cash with doling out money for all the bakshis. And then when we opened and the sun was going down, we were it, it, they were locking it up. The, our escort and so on was fidgety, and we had to be okay. You only got a few more minutes and so on. We opened up my teleprompter because for long on cameras, like for what you're about to hear here, I use the teleprompter. Prompter. I can just nail it if it's in the teleprompter. We screwed onto the lens of the camera and we opened it up and somebody had thrown it into the back of the van and it was just shattered. All the glass in the lens was shattered. So I'm looking through broken shards to try to read this. The cops on camels are coming. The driver and the escort are getting fidgety. We're running out of time. And this is the one chance I have to get these on cameras. The open of the show, the, this thing here that sets up all the ancient art and the next morning, we're heading off to Luxor or Alexandria and it's, we're done in Cairo. So it was so exciting and we just nailed it. It's so cool to be filming at the pyramids. Conic sites of Egypt, four or 5,000 years old, are basically buildings and art for dead people. Back then, they believed you could take it with you. And your big challenge, to be sure your body and your valuables survived the journey into the afterlife. That's why, if you had the power and the money, you'd lock everything up in a big tomb, a pyramid. These are the most famous, the Pyramids of Giza. But the oldest pyramid is actually nearby at Zakara, the tomb of the king or pharaoh named Zosher. This structure, which marked his tomb, is a step pyramid. Dating from around 2600 BC, it's a century older than its more famous sisters at Giza. This first ever towering stone structure is more than just a grave marker. With an innovative stacking of layers, it provided a new way to glorify a king, creating a stairway to eternity. A visit to Cairo's Egyptian Museum helps bring the country's many ancient sites to life. Along with the Grand Egyptian Museum at Giza, this museum shows off the best collection of ancient Egyptian art anywhere. The core of the collection, art from the age of the pharaohs, dates from about 3000 to 1000 BC. So you heard me reference the uh, Great Egyptian Museum at Giza. Well, that's the big news in Egyptian tourism. There is a museum that makes this one look quaint and charming that they're opening up at the, at the pyramids at Giza. And it is massive. We went to visit it. They wanted us to visit it because they're so excited about it, but it's unfinished. And um, that in the future will probably be the major museum. So when we produce these shows, we want them to last a long time. And it's just really frustrating to be filming when there's a big thing that'll be open next year and we can't include it in the show. But this museum will continue to be an important museum. But today it is packed with the with the treasures of ancient Egyptian art. Now for me, the great challenge is to come in here, we have a couple of hours to do it, and then to, to blitz the place with Simon and look at the script and how are we gonna cover it? We want that one or that one. And I know what I want, but Simon knows how to make the TV show. So he'll say, well, this will work better than that. So we go organize the whole script and we scout everything without the camera gear. And then we make a shot list. On this shoot, we had two cameramen. So one cameraman would go over there with a shot list and I'd go with Carl and Simon do the on cameras and the more uh, finely kind of worked art. And uh, we needed every minute we had. And we got in there, we thought we had all of our legalities figured out and it turned Turned out there was confusion in our permissions. So we had to sit there for about an hour just waiting for them to sort through the bureaucracy. Finally, we got the uh, all clear and we scouted and we put it together. And what you're going to have now is about as much art as you can inflict in somebody in one TV show before their eyes glaze over. And what I wanted to do was condense everything I learned and loved about Egyptian art from my college art class into this couple of minutes and uh, make it entertaining as well. So here you got the essence of Egyptian art in the greatest museum anywhere for Egyptian art. Nearly everything filling these old halls is funerary art, 
art designed to help save the souls of the pharaohs. Statues filled with symbolism, written prayers, and offerings to deal with the gods and help assure a happy transition into the afterlife. This ancient art is so well preserved because most of it was hidden away for 4,000 years, dark and dry, in tombs. This portrayal of geese from 2500 BC is perhaps the oldest surviving painting. This seated scribe recalls the importance of the educated elite in the court of an often illiterate king. And this couple, a husband and wife, was also found in a tomb. It's all art for the dead, locked up until rediscovered in modern times. Many mummies patiently await your visit. Ancient Egyptians preserved bodies through a complex process of mummification in hopes that the soul could re-inhabit it in the next world. And the coffins were elaborately painted with an inventory of things that hopefully would accompany the body and with prayers to be sure all went as planned. The art looks essentially the same from century to century. A remarkable thing about ancient Egyptian art and society as a whole was its stability. For 2,000 years, from 3,000 to 1,000 BC, relative to other times and other cultures, very little changed. Religion permeated Egyptian society. As long as things were going reasonably well, the gods were happy, and it was status quo. Every year, the Nile would flood, bringing water and fertile silt to the land. When the gods are happy, the people have food, and you don't change things. And the pharaoh was considered a god. If your leader is a god, you question nothing. You obey the rules. Things stay the same. Akhenaten was the one exception in a 2,000-year line of conformist pharaohs. One of the bad things about getting older is your cultural references become dated. I mean, 2,000-year line of conformist pharaohs. You know, 20 years ago, I said 2,000 years of Eisenhower, and people understood what that meant. Also, I love to call Akhenaten's um, lips Mick Jagger lips, but fewer and fewer people would relate to that. But here we have Akhenaten, and uh, oh, man, to be right there is so exciting. I want to remind you, we're going to be answering your questions after the show. So if you have any questions about our experience there or Egypt or the filming, write it down in your um, Q&A widget there, and Ben and I will try to get to it when the show's over. Rather than the same predictable, idealized features, Akhenaten had his own voluptuous looks. From a strangely curvaceous body to big, sensuous lips. Ruling around 1400 BC, he was considered history's first monotheist. Akhenaten replaced all the gods of the Egyptian pantheon with one all-powerful being, the sun god, whom he called Aten. In reliefs from the reign of Akhenaten, we see Aten, the sun, shining down on everything. During the time of Akhenaten, people were portrayed looser, more intimately. Casual family scenes must be from the time of Akhenaten. As always, I appreciate the services of a guide, so I'll understand the symbolism and know what to look for. So we're joined by my friend and fellow guide, Marwa Abbas. So I met Marwa in 2015, and I just thought, Tarek's got great guides, and I, they, I thought they'd be great on TV, and they are. Uh, I came back four years, five years later, and we just had a great time with our guides. I'm such a fan of hiring private guides while you're in Egypt. Marwa here is just brilliant with her tour groups. This is what she does every day. And she was so poised and, and just sharp as a tack when the camera was rolling. For TV, it's different because you can't just talk on and on. You've got a very tight description. So, uh, you know, we compressed her message and we got it across. And I was so thankful for Marwa and our other guides. So once again, our tour operator in Egypt was uh, Tarek's company, and that's called Egypt and Beyond. If you're curious about that, you can just Google Egypt and Beyond and learn more about Tarek and his wonderful group of guides.
She explained how lots of ancient hieroglyphic writing on papyrus survives and how it helps us better understand the mysteries of the pharaohs. Papyrus is made out of the stem of the plant papyrus, which is hammered, and then it is woven, and then we press it in a pressing machine or stones to get those beautiful papers. These are the hieroglyphs, one of the most ancient written languages, because of which we understood a lot about the civilization of ancient Egypt. So these are beautiful paintings of the afterlife. Even in the afterlife, they were trying to bribe the gods and deities in order to help them in the afterlife path. Even here in front of the judge Osiris is a big offering pile of lotus, onions, oxen leg, as well as breads and vegetables. Anything to make the god happy. Anything to make him happy. The son of Akhenaten was Tutankhamun, perhaps the most famous pharaoh. A highlight of the museum's collection is a section filled with King Tut's treasures, from his splendid coffin to his jewelry. This is exquisite. It is a beautiful piece of the jewelry of Tutankhamun around the year 1300 BC, made out of gold, turquoise, lapis lazuli, and you can see the beautiful symbolism over here, where you can see the scarab, the sign of existence, as well as the sun disk, the cobras wearing the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, as well as Anch, symbol of life. The ancient Egyptians used to mummify their bodies and also mummified their organs. King Tutankhamun, around the year 1300 BC, had his organs inside this beautiful alabaster box, and that was also inside a wooden gilded beautiful box that had the surroundings of the four goddesses for protection. So it was always about the protection. The mask of Tut looks like his face, so his soul could recognize him on his journey to the afterlife. Placed over the head of his mummy, it was 24 pounds of gold, with a cobra and a vulture to symbolize the United Kingdom of Upper and Lower Egypt, which Tut proudly ruled. So that's about as much art as I think you can inflict on a normal TV audience right there. And now it's time for something entirely different. And that would be going into the touristy shopping district called Khan al Khalili. What a wonderful break after the museum. I love this gate here. I love that sort of entry feel. And we walked by this man that's uh, the merchant standing out front here five or six times as we tried to get the right sort of uh, ambience as I walked in. Each time he just politely said, hello, as I walked by and I said, hello. The Egyptians we met, we're so friendly. It's just a warm and inviting country. After the museum, Cairo's characteristic old quarter is a colorful celebration of today's Egypt. Khan al Khalili is the mega mall of medieval bazaars. 600 years ago, it was a caravanserai, a stop on a caravan trade route. Then, when the Ottoman Turks took Egypt, it became a bustling Turkish bazaar. Today, it's a stop for every tour group, and the merchants are standing by. How are you? Huh? How are you? And uh, all my life in my travels, I've been walking through, you know, labyrinthine bazaars like this, whether in Marrakesh or Istanbul or, uh, or, or, or Cairo. And I've always wanted to capture it on film because everybody's coming at you and they've got their cute little come-ons and these funny little sentences. And I've tried and tried and never been able to make it. So this was the time I was determined. I had Cairo's greatest touristy market scene. Uh, the crew was having lunch and Marwa and I went out and we actually interviewed these guys. We found the guys and we said, you got to look into the camera and you got to smile and you got to say your line. And then we put it together and Simon gave us the time to do this and it actually worked out. Another thing I've always enjoyed doing is uh, bargaining in a scene like this and giving people tips on bargaining. And, you know, it's just fun to see that price coming down. $20. Okay. $10. Okay. $5. And you got it, you know. And uh, I wanted to just get that price cascading down. I missed that sound bite of that. We tried and tried, but couldn't get it. But I did get the very last bit. What? Okay. $5. You get the t-shirt. And uh, so we got the little, okay, five bucks. And I got my t-shirt. How can I take your money? Eager to charm you into a little shopping. Welcome, just have a look here. Everything is free. Welcome to Egypt. Today, 100% discount because today my birthday. If I want two free today, cheap it cheap. No money, no honey, no cry. The hustlers can be intense and annoying or fun, depending on your approach. Hello, my friend. Hello. Good morning. 
dive in with a sense of humor. Bargaining is expected in Egyptian markets. Treat it as a game. Never feel sorry for or obligated to the merchant. If you see something you like, show some interest and see how low you can get the price. Here, your size, maybe five dollars. Big size, blue. <laughs> give me five dollars. Okay, give me okay, five dollars. Okay. I find that simply venturing a few blocks away from the tourist-friendly bazaar, suddenly the tourists are gone. So that was frankly, disgustingly touristy. All the tour groups are there, all the merchants are speaking English first and you know they're ready to take you. And it's fun. And as I said, you gotta have a sense of humor about it. But one thing I really, really encourage people to do is break out of that. It's not that tough. You just walked right across the big street and then you lose yourself in what we're gonna show you next. This is the back door of the Egyptian market district. And I scouted this a few days before. I just blitzed the place and I, I was running around and I found exactly the little vignettes of life that the Kanafa guy, the, the guy chipping the tombstone, the bakery, the guys with bicycles with all their bread racks on there and the, the koshery shop and uh, just so much fun. And we came back with our camera and it was just everybody was right there and everybody was friendly and we just got to nail it. As you watch this, enjoy the music that um, our, our, our editor, Steve Camarano, artfully puts behind the scene. You hardly appreciate it, but it is an unsung hero of these TV shows. Also, in the beginning, you're going to see me hopping into one of these three-wheeled taxis. I just love these tuk-tuks. And imagine the challenge for the cameraman to be producing this, because he's got to get me getting in. He's got to get the drive-by from outside. He's got to get the POV from what I see as we're driving. He's got to show me inside. And he's got to even hang out the door as we're driving to show me looking out the window with wide eyes and enthusiasm. So. All of this is done just in a couple of hours. We've got the greatest crew, and it's so important to have a cameraman who can physically do all of this and be thinking as an editor, because what he brings home, those are the pieces we have to work with. And I'm swallowed up in a completely local scene. Wandering through the colorful market streets here in Cairo's Islamic Quarter, you feel that it goes on forever. Three-wheeled tuk-tuks weave through the action. I love to hop in one for a quick joyride. There's something strangely graceful about this chaotic dance of careening vehicles, merchants, and pedestrians. Exploring the Islamic Quarter creates a montage of memories. It's a commotion of activity. Everywhere you look, something you've never seen before is happening. Somehow, Bikers balance rustic racks of bread. Craftsmen inscribe marble tombstones with verses from the Holy Quran. The peaceful soul, after a blessed life, will finally rest in heaven. With a little effort, you'll find it can be easy to become part of the scene. In this shop, a man spins delicate strands of flour that will become a favorite local pastry. Kanafa. The classic street food here is koshery. Lentil, rice, pasta, garlic, and tomato sauce, all mixed together into a quick and cheap treat. The distinctive clanging stokes local appetites. And small bakeries are steadily producing hot balloons of pita bread, destined to be filled with falafel. Bread is subsidized by the government to make life easier for people struggling to feed their families. Walking through neighborhoods like this, you gain an appreciation for how just making ends meet is a daily struggle for millions in a teeming city like Cairo. I make a point to explore a variety of neighborhoods. Here in Egypt, like almost anywhere, there's a big gap between rich and poor. In the relative cool of the evening, the prosperous streets of downtown are filled with window shoppers and thriving eateries. Clearly a world for Egypt's more privileged class. So as a tourist, you see the tourist sites 
and then you either walk around the streets by your hotel and you see what we just saw there, kind of an upper class shopping district, or you venture out into the market scene and you see the reality of all the poor working people. It's just important if you're traveling or if you're making a TV show about a place or a tour guide to try to show different uh, strata, different slices of the local social scene. And they're in a, in a country that is generally poor like Egypt, wealthy people pay extra money to have an exclusive gated community. And any successful businessman will probably live out here. And this is where my friend Tarek lived. This is, he, he met his wife here in this uh, beautiful social club. His kids hang out here with kids that are well-educated and privileged. And I wanted to show that. Uh, when you have a TV crew and you ask permission, they think you're gonna make a movie and it just causes all sorts of complexity and usually you get no for an answer. So sometimes it's easier just to go in with our little cameras and shoot until they say to stop shooting. And then we get the pieces we need. We got a beautiful slice here of this privileged end of Cairo. And then we went to dinner with Tarek and met his wonderful family and his adorable kids. And his, his just his such a, just a, a charming, smart wife that we could have spent a lot more time with. But it was great to be able to share that as part of this show on Cairo. And gated social clubs in a place like Egypt provide a refuge where the wealthy can live in a parallel world, protected from the gritty reality of the streets. My friend Tarek, who runs a successful tour company, has invited me out for the evening. Tarek grew up as a member here. He met his wife here. And today, their children enjoy this privileged environment almost daily. These clubs have something for all generations. Birthday parties, playgrounds, competitive sports. Adults can retreat to the no kid zone to play a quiet game of croquet with friends they've been socializing here with since childhood, or just to watch from the peaceful terrace. We finish our evening just down the street at Tarek's home, joining his family for dinner. So how do you say, uh, in French, you would say bon appétit? Bon appétit, yeah. In Arabic? Milhana wishifa. Milhana? Milhana wishifa. Bilhana? Milhana wishifa. That's very difficult. Bon yeah. appétit. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. I think so. Mm. Yeah, but this is so beautiful. Can you Thank give you. me, please, a tour of this beautiful Egyptian meal? Sure. This is moussaka. Okay. This is the stuffed vine leaves. Stuffed vine leaves. Okay, and this is okra with tomato sauce. Okra, nice. Very delicious. And this is the Egyptian beef with the onion sauce. And this is, of course, rice. This is the rokak. Rokak? Yes. What is rokak? It's some kind of pastry stuffed with the minced meat. And? This is the ziki. Tzatziki. So we have moussaka. Common between us and the <laughs> Greek. <laughs> yes. I was going to say Greek. moussaka, the stuffed grape leaves, and Tzatziki, yeah, but a, a Greek Egyptian would say that's way. my food, but it's Egyptian also. We cook it differently. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So, shukran. So is it normal for children to speak English and Egyptian? Uh, actually, in an international school. Yeah. yeah, and your kids go to international school. Yes, American ones. Uh, sometimes on Friday or Thursday, we uh, watch on the TV, Netflix, we choose a... Um, an English movie. You can choose Egyptian or yeah. English. Family movie. It's family we call movie. It family yeah, movie. Every Thursday night is family movie. And uh, and Heba, what do you wish for your daughters uh, to be successful and to be happy? Mm. To have good faith. Uh -huh. Good education as well. To be uh -huh. open-minded. Uh -huh. um, Self-confident. Beautiful. No, I think easy. you're on the right road. I think you're on the right road. <laughs> What a delightful thing to be able to sit and have a meal with a, a family like that and to hear the mom talk about what she aspires for her children, to have good faith, to have a good education, to be open-minded, self-confident. Now, it would have been inappropriate in this setting for me to want to drink a beer. Remember, observant Muslims don't enjoy alcohol. They all have tea uh, or some other kind of drink. Uh, if you want your beer in 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 Egypt, you can get it at a hotel, but uh, you can feel a little tension between the Western society and the more conservative uh, Muslim society. And uh, alcohol, stores that sell alcohol actually have their windows boarded up. So if there is a riot, they won't come at them and, and take it out of them for selling the um, drink that's not right for that culture. So be respectful of the local culture. That is just common sense when you're traveling and you, 
have a better experience. You make more friends, you spend less money, and you realize what a beautiful thing Papa, Papa Ganoush is with that beautiful, beautiful smoked, um, just eggplant and, 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 and the uh, pomegranate and, uh, and having gone to the bakery and then having your pita bread, it's a delight. Thank goodness we were able to get to know Tarek's family. I hope so. <laughs> It's lovely. <laughs>
Well, we decided it takes 60 words to properly ex explain the Sphinx. Not too much, not too little, 60 words. Here's the last stop on this half hour look at Cairo. The Sphinx described in 60 words. Side complementing the scene is the mysterious Sphinx. As old as the pyramids, it was carved out of a piece of hard rock that stuck above the limestone plateau. With the body of a lion and the head of a king or god, it came to symbolize both strength and wisdom as it faces east and the rising sun. The Sphinx faces the promise of the rising sun, and so does Cairo, as Egypt's ancient story continues to unfold. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. So there you go, a half hour look at Cairo. Uh, it was so fun to put all these ducks in a row and then to realize we're shooting a one hour show and then out of that, we're gonna get two half hour shows. So this on camera right here, we didn't need it for the one hour show because we were going directly from here to Alexandria. But this is the way we wrapped up the first half of the one hour to make the half hour episode you've just watched. Things worked really well for us. We had beautiful weather, we had great guiding and I just had so much fun filming in Egypt last year. So um, I want to remind you, we couldn't have done it without our guide, our wonderful guide, Tarek, and his staff, his guides. His company is called um, Egypt and Beyond. And I couldn't have had such a delightful evening without my friend Shazad, who's got his little restaurant right here in Edmonds called Caravan Kebab. So we've had a lot of fun sharing Egypt with you. I want to remind you next week, we go to part two of Egypt. We're going to cruise the Nile from Alexandria on the Mediterranean all the way south of Aswan and the famous Aswan Dam to Abu Simbel. Right now, I'm going to go back to Ben and I'd love to answer your questions. Shokran, Rick, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, before we get to some great viewer questions, how about a word from our sponsor this evening? Well, thank you, Ben. And uh, I do want to credit Ben also. Ben went to Egypt about a year before I did with our script just to check it out. So Ben, you're a good traveler and you met Tarek and I think you had a wonderful time there too, didn't you? So we have uh, just a moment here to let you know what's going on at Rick Steves Europe. Uh, I'm very privileged to uh, have a team of 100 uh, staff uh, and we're just keeping it together. We're keeping our team together even though we have no income this year because we're gonna be here and ready to go when we throttle up and get back into taking our groups around Europe. At Rick Steves Europe in 2019, we took 30,000 people on 1200 tours around Europe. Uh, this year, uh, 2020, we printed up this uh, brochure here, 2020 tours, and we were probably 80% sold out by the time COVID hit. We had 24,000 people signed up and then had to give back all their deposits and say, hey, we're gonna be around when we come out of this thing. So we've got the new version of our, of our uh, catalog and this just brags about the 40 different itineraries that we lead all around Europe. And um, we've got, uh, it's the 2021 catalog. It's not in print, but it, it's available in a beautiful PDF file and that's at ricksteves.com. We're not taking deposits until we're ready and confident that we can do Europe um, with stability and predictable and reliability and safety and health and so on. But when the time is right, we're gonna be here. We've got our itineraries. We've already reserved our hotels and we're taking names. We've already got about 15,000 people's names on tours for 2021. And if you wanna be the first to know let us know which tour you're interested in. Go to ricksteves.com, put your name in that list, and we'd love to have you there and with us as we continue to enjoy the European travel we so much appreciate. By the way, it's our Christmas sale time at Rick Steves Europe on our website, and everything is between 20 and 50% off, and that includes all of our books. And um, these are the two uh, best-selling books these days. Uh, these are the books I wrote just last year, as if I knew there was going to be a lockdown and we wouldn't be able to travel and we wanted something fun to read as we got through this sort of delay in our travel dreams. The 100 Top Masterpieces of European Art is a book I've long wanted to write. I partnered with my friend and one of our most uh, important uh, writers and, and researchers and tour guides, Gene Openshop, and it's a gorgeous coffee table book that just features all of our 100 favorite pieces of art, each with a beautifully crafted uh, tight essay. And it is just, it's an inspirational sweep through the story of Europe from the Parthenon 
all the way to Picasso. And that's a great gift if you've got a traveler on your gift list and the price will never be better for what you see right now during our Christmas sale. And this is a book that I'm so thankful to have out. I locked myself up in 2019, not knowing we're all gonna be locked up in 2020 in order to write this book. This is a collection of my 100 favorite essays, 400 pages for the, look at that guy, love in Europe. For the love of Europe, my favorite places, people, and stories. And uh, I just love this book because it showcases all my favorite experiences and memories. 400 pages, and that's a lot of fun. So everything we got on our website, you're more than welcome to check that out. I do want to remind you, it's Christmas time, and this is a time that we all show our love and how we care about our community and how we look out for people who are struggling, I would hope. And if you're into that, Every year we have a fundraiser at Rick Steves Europe and we try to raise a million dollars for my favorite charity. And my favorite charity is an advocacy organization called Bread for the World. Advocacy means lobbying. And there's lobbying for good things and there's lobbying for bad things, depending on your politics. I like to support lobbying for hungry people, lobbying for um, development aid. And Bread for the World is the most effective voice for people who are struggling with hunger in Congress. And that's why I like to empower them. Uh, we're gonna, uh, the deal is uh, they're at the table right now as our government is deciding for a trillion dollar uh, stimulus package. What about food stamps? What about poor people rather than the middle class? What about hungry people? What about people south of the border? Um, and there's lots of reasons to be excited about the practical investment in helping people who are struggling with hunger. That's why this is where I put my philanthropic dollar. And I'm putting 500,000 of my philanthropic dollars into this this Christmas if I can challenge my traveling friends to make that much collectively. If you can give $100, I will match it with another $100. I just checked with my staff. And as of today, 3,758 people have donated $100 or more to Bread for the World, raising $478,000. That's good, but it's not $500,000. We need to make it to $500,000. I'm going to match it. And like we did last year, we'll raise a million dollars for Bread for the World. Extra little bonus apart from the matches, I'd love to send you as a thank you our DVD box set with all the TV shows we've ever made on 17 discs or our collection of three beautiful Christmas gifts that are associated with our Christmas in Europe TV special. So if you wanna learn more about that, go to ricksteves.com and on the front page, on the landing page of our website, you'll see a tile that's talking about fighting hunger with our annual fundraiser for Bread for the World. So that's my advertisement. And I'd like to now turn it back to Ben and answer some of your questions. All right, Rick. Um, you know, you've been traveling to Egypt for many years. What first brought you to the country and how has it changed since your first visit? Wow, that's a great question. I, when I was a kid, when I was um, in, at the University of Washington, I was teaching my European travel class. And I remember it was, a, it was an eight hour lecture. I taught it every Saturday. It was from nine till five and, uh, and it was an hour break for lunch. And then that night, I would have a three-hour talk called Travel Beyond Europe. And the three-hour talk would be talking about Turkey, Morocco, and Egypt. So even as a kid, I was going to these countries because it really spices up your European adventure. And, and you know that, Ben, because you've traveled in Egypt. Um, I remember it was frightening the first time I was going to Egypt. I mean, there was rumors in Europe. I mean, all the hippies were going from Greece down to Cairo. It's a $100 flight, you know, and you're in the middle of Egypt. And people were saying, there's no maps there. It's so hot that the tires on the cars are melting to the streets. I mean, that was my concern. It was so hot that tires were melting the streets and there was no maps. It's just an example of how there's that anxiety before you get to a place. And then when you finally get there, you realize, ah, take a break. You know, we're going to be uh, playing, you know, temporary locals and having the time of our lives. So I went there as a kid and it was scary until I got there. And then I've, I've uh, enjoyed traveling in Egypt really um, intermittently ever since. Another interesting question, Rick. Um, how would you reconcile the desire to travel in places like Egypt, but also oppose their uh, governmental regime and not want to, to support that through yes. travel? How do you reconcile that issue? Well, you know, I'm a progressive American and I would support progressive uh, democracies and you know economic justice and uh, freedom of the press and all that kind of stuff but it's a complicated world 
And you could really, you can, you can say, oh, Saddam Hussein's terrible, get rid of him. You could say, oh, Muammar Gaddafi's terrible, get rid of him. You could say, Erdogan's terrible, get rid of him. But you got to remember, if you get rid of Assad, what are you going to have left? You're going to have, a, maybe you're going to have a broken society. So we have to be a little bit practical. And I don't know what's right or wrong, to be honest. But I do know that some countries just cannot handle modern democracy quite yet. And they need training wheels. I saw a little fragile tree in a village on the Nile and it was a little tree and it was had a little cute little brick castle built around it so that the tree could grow without it being trampled by carts or eaten by goats or whatever. And when I saw that little fragile tree growing in that mud brick encasement, I thought that's a metaphor for Egyptian democracy. And the mud brick encasement was a government that was not a free pluralistic government. Uh, it was a military dictatorship, frankly, that was letting democracy survive in those constraints with that guidance to let it go. Again, it's complicated. I don't know what the answers are, but I wouldn't condemn Egypt for not having democracy any more than I would roll back the clock and get rid of Saddam Hussein or or Muammar Gaddafi just because they're bad guys. Uh, there are broken states. Frankly, there's a lot of states in, in North Africa and the Middle East that were created by greedy Europeans who had no interest in, in what's right. They just drew lines in the sand, ignoring tribal traditions and so on, creating countries that wouldn't exist, that couldn't exist in a democracy. The only way they can exist is with a uh, heavy-handed auto autocratic government. You get rid of that heavy-handed auto autocratic government, you have chaos. Uh, what comes into that? The caliphate of ISIS, which is actually closer to a logical country. What ISIS had, I'm certainly not supporting ISIS, but that fits tribal boundaries more closely than Iraq, which was created by Europeans 100 years ago with borders that are nonsense. So it's complicated. That's my point. And it's a great chance to go there and learn about it. So I think it's wrong not to go to a country because you disagree with their government. I think we go to that country and we talk to the people and we learn about them and they learn about us and people to people connections. Let the fabric of a society get a little tougher so they can speak truth to power. So we will have empathy for them when it comes to standing up for them in tough times. Travel is fundamental to peace. And that's one reason we work so hard on our staff to keep America traveling. Our mission is to inspire and equip Americans to venture beyond Orlando. And we travel out of our comfort zones and we humanize this planet. And it makes it tougher for their propaganda to demonize us. And when we come home, it makes it tougher for our propaganda to demonize them. And that's one of the great joys of our teaching and our mission here at Rick Steves Europe. Um, another question, Rick. You noted, uh, and in the video it also noted, the use of a, a dollars to pay for a shirt. Uh, do you use Egyptian pounds in Egypt or do you use American dollars? It would be much better travel to use Egyptian pounds. And it would be much better travel to speak the language. Uh, I don't speak the language. It was a very, very touristy place. And their first word is dollars or euros. And uh, that's what I did there. That was in a touristy zone. When you're in a small town or when you're out in a, in a normal place that's not just almost exclusively touristic, you would want to use the local currency, not the American dollars. So that's a very good point. Yeah. And we have time for just one more question, Rick. Uh, some people are curious how they would prepare for a trip to Egypt without a Rick Steves guidebook, because of course we don't produce one. Is there literature you'd recommend? Any other tips you might suggest? You know, the Lonely Planet book is the go-to book for countries like this. Uh, there are other publishers also. I don't know how many publishers are going to be standing after the COVID experience. You know, it's really tough for travel publishers. I wasn't that wild about the Lonely Planet book. I always, if I'm going anywhere where I don't write guidebooks, I want a guidebook and I've got the Lonely Planet or the best book I can find. I would recommend um, patronizing a bookstore, an independent bookstore that really knows travel books and see what they recommend about Egypt. Um, but, uh, you know, thank goodness for Lonely Planet. They cover all the countries that we don't cover. They don't cover it in the way that people are accustomed to with the Rick Steves guidebook. Um, but uh, you can't just go to where I write about it. So you're gonna have to branch out of that. Uh, I use the Lonely Planet. Hey, um, I'm just so, I'm having so much fun with this uh, Monday Night Travels. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I wanna remind you uh, every Monday, 
we're going to get together just like this. Next week, it's the Nile, part two of today's show, and I've still got some baba ganoush left over. I doubt if it'll be around that long. I'm just really enjoying it. By the way, I want to thank again my friend Shazad at Caravan Kebab for the beautiful food. His restaurant's right here in Edmonds. I want to remind you, next week, we're going to Egypt again. Uh, the week after that, we're coming on to Christmas. And on the 21st of December, we're going to have a special evening on Monday Night Travel. And it's going to be celebrating Europe in seven different countries. So uh, put that in your calendar. Please join us then. And then after that, we're going to have a new show called Why We Travel. It's a love note to European travel. Then we're going to go to Ethiopia. So we got lots of travel coming your way. Uh, thanks, Ben, for your help tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And I want to wish you happy travels, even if we're all just staying home for a while. Mm -hmm.